Business Growth Talks podcast is created and hosted by Mark Haywin. In this show, we talk about how to grow a business in the growth stage. The growth stage is often marked by rapid developments, increased revenue, and an escalating customer base. In each episode, we talk to entrepreneurs and business owners who have grown businesses and we cover topics like scaling processes, market expansion, financial management, human resource and talent development, and customer retention. If you are looking for actionable advice, tips, and techniques on how to grow, run and build your business, this is the podcast for you. Just a quick one. I just wanted to say thank you very much for joining me today and being with me on this show. One thing that is really important that I want to share with you is this show is growing really well and I'm so proud of it and I'm so pleased that you're enjoying this content. But if you could please hit the follow and subscribe to this channel, it will really help the channel on it's been able to grow and the people that we can have on this show. So please do consider if you have a moment, please can you hit the subscribe button and the follow button and I would really appreciate it. Today we have Colin Gray, who's a visionary leader and CEO of North Labs, a fractional cloud data analytics company that helps manufacturing and industrial organizations harness the power of data to become more efficient and innovative. Under Colin's leadership, North Labs has grown into a premier top tier Snowflake partner, the only veteran owned Snowflake partnership in the world and advanced tier AWS partner. Before uh, founding North Labs, Colin served in the NATO Special Operations during his time in the US Air Force. His deep expertise in consulting, cloud computing and data analytics has made him a trusted advisor to many companies. Colin's mission is to empower businesses by aligning people, processes and technology to drive long term success. Hello, Colin. How are you today? Mark, pleasure to be here. Doing well. I'm so glad you're with me. And this is a little bit different for us. We get a lot of like marketing and we get like uh, speakers and tech companies, but, and this is in the tech world, but it is a very different beast of the analytics side. And we were just talking off before I hit record about my experience of like sort of eight to 10 years ago when analytics became a real massive interesting and valuable tool for companies for corporates and uh hopefully we can delve deep into your experience and your knowledge in this industry so i'm very much looking forward to it thank you colin absolutely glad to be here first question as i ask all of my guests is what does a business mindset mean to you it was really it really got my gear spinning when you prompted me for that and if you had asked me this two weeks ago, I think I would have given you a different answer. Oh, interesting. Well, um, give me both, but give me the one you want to give now. Yeah. A couple of weeks ago, I think it would have been getting up every day and accomplishing your tasks and scaling a business and everything like that. But I really think with the help of, I belong to a peer group of business owners in a network called Vistage. They're like my private advisory group yeah. and they view a business mindset as capital allocation. At the end of the day, when you are an entrepreneur, whether you're just getting started or you're scaling a $100 million business, your role as a CEO, in addition to being a visionary, in addition to hopefully understanding your mission in the world better than anyone, is to learn how to properly allocate capital and really figure out where you need to apply fuel at various times in the organization to continue moving toward your goals. So that would be my answer. When I think of myself as an entrepreneur now, I think of myself as a capital allocator, which is it's a new thought process for me that I'm still getting used to. But so I think just it so applies I'm clear, to- So capital allocation, you're talking whether you're allocating it money into marketing or money into operations or money into finances or money into employees. So it's, it's, you're basically thinking of your definition now is that depending on where you're allocating your funds to grow that business. Exactly. I think there are two varieties of founders. And what I've learned over the years is you have your starter and you have your scaler. And even though I've started a few companies, admittedly, I'm not very good at starting companies. Okay. Going from zero revenue to 5 million in revenue, that's really difficult for me. 
I'm a lot better at taking a $5 million company and scaling it to 15 million to 20 million in revenue. And of course, when you're just getting started and the business is smaller, it's all hands on deck. Yeah. As a founder, you're wearing as many hats as you need to get the job done. But over time, hopefully you're adding people process and technology into the fold to where you can take a step out of the day to day and assume more oversight up in the crow's nest of the ship. And that's really where your mindset has to shift to, okay, I, I don't need to tie everybody's shoes anymore. I'm not required for every conversation. Hopefully I have people who feel empowered to make those decisions within the business. So your role really transforms into, are we staying the course? Are we following the standard operating procedures we've put in place? Is there accountability to the autonomy that we have? And then where are we underspending, overspending? Where do we have bloat? Where do we have demand for more budget, more capital? And that's really where I find myself today is I'm really no longer needed in the day to day of North Labs or other businesses I've been invested in. It's really my responsibility to say, okay, who needs more fuel, more ammunition mm -hmm. for what they're doing? And how can we restructure things? How can we apply different weight to varying areas of the business to keep everything moving forward? Because it's not linear. It's not just give everyone a little bit of budget and they'll make it work. Sometimes you're needing to take budget from elsewhere and triple down in marketing or sales or delivery. And so it really becomes your responsibility as the CEO to see it over the horizon mm -hmm. and plan for that appropriately. So you're more proactive as opposed to reactive. Why don't you think you like the early stage setup of a startup? I am someone who I'm really good at taking things from 0% to 80% a process, a go-to-market strategy, I can do that better than just about anybody. When it comes to that 80% to 100%, I's dotted, T's crossed, the bow is on it. I'm not very good at that. And when you're in the early days of a startup, some people might say, yeah, it's all 80%, but you really, you need to tie things off. You need to have a very presentable go-to-market plan. You need to have a very sound standard operating procedure and processes around how you do things. That's a weakness. But at the startup, you don't. That's the beauty of a startup is that everyone's in there. There's no specializations. There's very few processes. You're all in it together. <laughs> just sometimes just have to make it work to mm -hmm. get it to market, to get it to the client. And I, I'm fascinated by your, your expectation of yourself and what you've with self-awareness understood by yourself that creating systems and processes and making decisions for a year down the line is what you're good at mm. and you're not good. You, you feel you're not good at the early stages. So why do you think you love the processes and systemization stage of growth? I'm fascinated to understand. Yeah. And I see where you're coming from and having lived through it, you're exactly right. I think that that time in the business where it's all hands on deck and everyone just gets stuff done and execute, that works to a point, right? You can scale from no revenue to call it a million in revenue of, yeah. of good yeah. quality revenue with everyone just, just running at Tracking everything it. all the time. Yeah. But yeah. that gap to, that's why so many businesses never make it over seven figures in revenue, yeah. I would argue. So you have that no man's land between 1 million and 5 million in revenue where you have to have some of those early processes. You have to have that scaffolding in order for things to take hold and, and the engine to start running on its own, mm, as opposed mm. to just holding the hand crank and turning it yourself. And some people don't like that, have real problems with that shift from everyone doing everything and getting shit done into actually having specialization teams and people and operations managers that are looking after everyone. Right. Some people struggle with that. Exactly. Yeah. And I don't know, maybe I am too hard on myself, but I just, I, when I look back on, this is the second business I've founded. I did exit the first one, but it got to about that 
million, million and a half a year in revenue mark. So it was all hands on deck, limited yeah. process. And someone came in and essentially bought our customer portfolio. Um, I just feel more confident in my decision-making abilities when I can go into a business, say businesses I've invested in or where North Labs is now, where we have teams, we have the accountability structure, really clear roles and responsibilities, how everything flows through the business. And then I can take a step back and go, okay, here's where the process is really shining. Here's where we're getting a little bit dull. And we either need to fix that with people, process, technology, capital, yeah. whatever. And we can measure how that improves over time. So I don't know, maybe it's, maybe my brain's too lazy for the, for the first piece, but I just find that I perform better in those areas of, okay, we're around four or 5 million. Now the goal is to get to 10 where there is a very definitive change in org structure, yeah. process, yep. legal nuance, whatever the case may be. And we're getting more sophisticated as a business. Yep. It's not just a checking account, invoices out, revenue in now. Now we're talking about maybe multinational teams. We're talking about compliance structures. We're talking about how to leverage money to make it work for the business yeah. outside of just invoices out, revenue in. Yeah. Anyway, I, I think it's no, I think it's, it's great there, awareness. I yeah. think it's great self awareness that you, it, and in essence, you don't, you might, you can do it and you obviously can do it. You just don't like doing it, which I think is absolutely, absolutely valid. Moving on. So you were in the Air Force and there was an element of NATO that you were involved in. Why don't you give me a little bit about what your experience in the military was? Sure. Yeah. I started, I enlisted in the Air Force out of high school. I was planning to, go to college and become an officer. But I was also pursuing collegiate baseball aspirations. I'm five foot nine as a buck 50 at the time. You're not in America. You're not really yeah. getting, yeah. you're sitting on the far end of the bench at yeah. that size. So yeah. when I figured out that it wasn't really going to come to fruition, I, I decided to enlist. I followed what my dad did. My dad is the top person in my life business owner, smartest person I've ever known. And he enlisted in the army way back when. So I decided to do the same. I enlisted in the Air Force, started out turning wrenches as someone who was not super mechanically adept okay. as a kid. Yeah, I got tossed into the most difficult aircraft to work on in the entire Air Force, the B-1, which is the most active aircraft since 9-11. And Ellsworth Air Force Base in South Dakota, shout out to Ellsworth, uh, has two of the three operating squadrons for the B-1s in the Air Force. So your time, a lot of your time is spent deployed overseas right. to support right. those aircraft. So yeah. I deployed right away after getting to Ellsworth. I eventually got transitioned to Ramstein Air Base in Germany to support the C-130s out there, which was like going from working on an old Yugo to working on they just run, they don't break. Right. So I was able to become all systems qualified. So I moved, I started my life in hydraulics and eventually became all systems qualified on the C-130. So qualified for engines, qualified for electrical systems, weapon systems, etc. And they made me a flying crew chief. So I got to fly around on these planes with very impressive people for a living in Eastern Europe, the Middle East, Africa, etc. And eventually I was attached to supporting NATO special operations. So a careful distinction here that I'm always, I always want to point out is I was not NATO special operations. I am not okay. cool enough to be those guys. They are the coolest, baddest people on the planet. But I did have the extreme honor of flying with them 270, 280 days a year. Right. So it would be. I was the least cool person on an aircraft at all times. You had two special operations pilots. You had a special operations loadmaster. At any given time, I'm flying with 82 Navy SEALs, British SAS, Delta, Green Beret, just the coolest people. And then me, right? So what an ego check 
for a, a 19, 20 year old kid to be surrounded by these high performing, high caliber, truly tip top of what the military has, of what NATO has to offer and being able to learn from them in terms of leadership, mindset, discipline. I think a lot of it carries over into how I run businesses today, but that, so I did that for just over five years. I was running my first business when I got out of the military. I sold it about a year later, finished my university degree, and then started North Labs after a two-year non-compete after I sold that first business. So let's move on to, and um, uh, firstly, I don't think you were the, the least coolest. If you've got all of that <laughs> expertise on the plane of all the systems... Like you, I, I understand you're being humble and, and I understand like compared to the SAS and, and all that, you, you Navy SEALs, you might not be quite as cool as them, but you were the reason why that plane was kept on going. So just. Yeah. Just knowing that I was able to support them doing what they had to do. Yeah. You know, we did a lot with, it depends on where you are in the world, but for us, we did a lot of both humanitarian aid in Africa. Yeah. But we also, there were times where you're like, hey, there's a a really bad man who's Mm. kidnapping children in Mm. a village in Africa, and we're going to go shake some things up because people are scared to leave their house and go to school and whatnot. And just knowing that you play a small part in even those children being able to walk to school and not being kidnapped from their families was something I'll never forget it. I think very fondly of moments like that. We had bad moments as well, of course, but just knowing that you were a small cog in that wheel to allow those high level operators to do what they were trained to do was, you know, something that I I definitely don't take for granted. Yeah. Uh, uh, Congratulations. And thank you for your service. I know it's a very American thing to say thank you. (laughs) No, I really, I, I think it's so important to have that support. So thank you very much. So let's move on. Let's not talk about the first business. I want to talk about North Labs. So what made you start in 2016? So North Labs really was a continuation of what I did with my first business. So I learned about AWS and and what Amazon was planning to do with the cloud back in 2007. So I was very early in the military. My father sent me a news link that I read when I was out on the flight line working on the B1 at the time, Amazon's going to start leasing data center space to companies Mm -hmm. by the second. And I I read it and I went, gee, this really does seem like a cool concept. So that was the cloud back then. And for whatever reason, I, I just said, I need to learn this. I need to figure this thing out. I'm not an IT guy. I like software and systems and stuff like that. Before we go any further, what gave you, because we're at a point with AI mm-hmm. and, and we'll come back to AWS and, and cloud, but we're at the point at AI. I just wanted to talk to you about AI where you saw a cloud in 2007 and that you needed to be involved in it and you wanted to be part of it because we're at that stage with AI in my view and whether it's a bubble, that's a, that's another conversation for another time, but it's interesting in, immersing myself as much as I can in AI because I know that it's a future that is going to be massively important for for the biz- for business generally but what made you in 2007 read that about cloud or, or learn that about cloud and then say I need to immerse myself that I need to start a business within within cloud because it's incredibly and we all see these trends and we go yeah no that's something that's important but what made you read that what you read, that article, whatever it was, and then go, I, I need to immerse myself and I'm going to immerse myself in that area. No, it's a really good question. And again, it I, I think kudos to my dad because I, I chatted with him. And if you knew my dad, this is completely ironic because he is not a technology savant. This right. is a guy who just got his first smartphone two years ago, <laughs> still likes to operate with a an Atlas book right. when he travels places, ran his business off of paper. Right. But he had spent a long time at Medtronic where they had done a large data center deployment. Right. And so in chatting with him, his the way he conveyed it to me was businesses are no longer going to need to spend $25 million to buy a warehouse, to procure their infrastructure, yeah. 
to set it all up, put the sprinkler systems in, hire guards, all the on-site staff and the repair techs. They're just going to be able to go and get it. And that was an aha moment for me mm-hmm. because anytime, just like with AI, anytime you offer a, a, that much of a better mouse trap to enterprises, yep. you're going to get adoption. Mm-hmm. And when something is so fundamentally yep. different, yep. you're going to get adoption. And so I, at the time, I just thought, hey, I believe in Amazon. They seem to be doing pretty well. Yep. Back then, they weren't nearly as big as they are now. Yeah. And yeah, for me, it was just, I I really do think that fundamentally it will change the physics of business and I want to learn about it and maybe I'll be wrong. And that's part of the risk of being an entrepreneur is you have to take those calculated risks sometimes. And in this circumstance, I happened to hitch my cart to a, a triple crown winner. Yeah. It wasn't much more than that. It was, I believe in this, the, the company who's rolling it out. I believe in how the technology can change things. And of course, you always go through your hype cycles and things like that. The yeah. cloud had that for yeah. sure. In the yeah. early 2010s, it seemed like everyone was giving up on the cloud and moving back to data centers because they moved too fast and too early. Mm. But we're obviously now in a position where every organization on the planet is thinking about cloud first. And and what is the percentage of the AWS in the Amazon business? I think I read something like 30 or 40% of Amazon's business is actually from AWS. Is that right? So it's right. The The thing to think about is of Amazon's market cap, AWS, and this is all public information, AWS is a hundred billion yeah, yeah. for Amazon. But the thing to to that really gets you is Amazon's dot com business has single percentage point net profit. Right. right. It's a low margin, very right. high volume business. Yeah. The cloud is the margin performance on the cloud is astronomical. Mm. So AWS has been Amazon's largest profit driver. Right. For a very long time. And I don't see that changing. The reason why I also possibly quick- sell the reason why I asked that question is I was I had my girls in the car we were driving to somewhere and and they were asking me about Amazon. They wanted to buy something on Amazon and we started talking about it and then they were what and I said that Amazon started from selling books and they were just mm-hmm. like what? I'm like yeah they mm-hmm. literally only sold books online and then we were talking about it and all the things they do and then I said there's this infrastructure this cloud so we had this quite a detailed conversation about it. And I, I think it's fascinating, as you say, like AWS has, has built a hugely profitable business, a hugely, uh, and the majority of business people that are not in the industry that you're in or aren't interested in tech would be completely blown away by the size and scale and profitability of AWS. I think it's just a, a fascinating way the company has been able to pivot and be able to build an incredibly powerful and strong business model where they had really no right to do. And it's gotten to the point, this is a fun, fun thing for your listeners. So I started back in 2007. Amazon was, I believe, about what a $350 million business Okay. in 2007. Right. They, not all that big. When you think about all of the compute infrastructure that they had to run Mm. Amazon back Mm. in 2007, Mm. they're now adding every day with new data centers for AWS consumption. It's massive what they're doing. That's incredible. Okay. So tell me about North Labs. What do you do? Who do you serve? And I just want to get a grasp of your business model. Yeah. So North Labs is a full service data analytics consulting firm. So we help organizations design, implement, and manage on an ongoing basis their data capabilities. And that it looks a little bit different for every customer, depending on the state of their maturity, what they're looking to accomplish, what their business goals are. But we're a one-stop shop for advisory, implementation, and then the ongoing 
data operations, right. we call it, yep. and act as that fractional bolt-on to their organization so they don't need to go out and hire a team of 15 or 20. Yep. They just bolt us on and we become an extension of their team. And why do you target industrial and manufacturing companies as your niche? That's definitely our largest niche. We play a lot in the technology space as well, but manufacturing industrial is definitely where our reputation is. And it's twofold. One, I'm fascinated by manufacturing and industrial organizations. I, I grew up in Minnesota, in the north central part of the yeah. US, lots of manufacturing. Yeah. I have lots of family who are in manufacturing. I just find it so interesting that you have to take so many raw inputs, consolidate it down to one manufacturing pipeline, and then you have that distribution arm. It's almost like a bow tie mm, when you think mm, about how mm. manufacturing works. And all of that is served with data. So it's a very complex system to make any sort of manufacturing or industrial organization work. And you will always have constraints in that business to solve whether it's supply chain, whether we're producing too much scrap off the assembly line and can't get orders out in time, or we're not properly planning to order our next round of raw materials, or we have too many products sitting on the shelf not being sold. There's always uh, just a, a, an array of constraints in those businesses. And secondly, selfishly, Mark, it's really difficult for organizations that look like mine to successfully sell into manufacturing groups because manufacturing groups historically do not care about mm. the technology you're selling. Mm. They don't care about AI because mm. it's the cool thing to do. They don't care about data and analytics because it's cool. They're applying every decision they make to fixing or filling the constraints they have in their business. And when you're a technology person, it's very easy to talk about the what, the tools. Let's mm. talk about AWS and Snowflake mm. or Microsoft Azure or mm. whatever the case may be. Mm. And those conversations don't get very far in manufacturing and industrial org. So for us to come in and say, tell us where your business is failing you right now or underperforming right now. Yeah. And if we can solve that with technology, yeah. now we have a very appetizing narrative to share with these companies. And it's something that you have to attend the school of hard knocks to figure that out, honestly. But luckily for the sake of my business, we've gotten pretty good at it. So that, that implies to me the marketing and sales conversations that you're having with these manufacturing and industrial companies is so important how you're pitching how you're talking to them using their language understanding their business model understanding they are what their pain points are how have and you said you've done it through hard knocks how have you developed that marketing and sales strategy for you to be able to grow your business yeah it's a great question and again manufacturing is very complex but when you think about what an average manufacturer is struggling with in in my mind, it really falls into sort of three buckets, right? You have the planning aspect of what they're trying to do. How do we get these raw materials quick enough turn so we don't have a bunch of money tied up in raw materials that could go bad mm, or mm. It, we're obviously, we're not liquid if we have raw steel yeah. sitting somewhere, that's not money. Yeah. So how do we get better at, at planning mm. and forecasting that supply chain? Mm. Secondly is the actual operations, the assembly of whatever you're making. And that's things like scrap rate, right? How much of what we're doing actually gets sent back for rework or gets tossed into this pile here mm. that gets sold off for pennies on the dollar, melted back down into raw material. That's no good for us. Mm. And so that's like the core manufacturing KPIs. Yeah. And then on the other side, where a lot of manufacturers are going is in predictive maintenance. When a machine goes down or a machine is inoperable, yeah. it costs a manufacturing organization a tremendous amount of potential revenue right. because that machine's not working. Yeah. But it's more than that. It's even if I have to 
reduce the speed of my line mm. from 100% to 25%. How much revenue are we missing? How much profit performance are we missing out on because of those partial shutdowns? Yeah. And so being able to use data and AI to get to a point where you're actually predicting the failure trends mm. of components within your assembly line, mm. you can now shut them down proactively fix them proactively, right? which saves oodles of money for these. Because you're maintaining or... something rather than it breaking and then stop and then you've got zero. You might drop to 70% activity because you're doing maintenance work. And so that predictive way of understanding the machinery, and that's done through your analytics that you're providing to them. That's right. Yeah. Our whole goal is to create a unified source of truth for our company's data, because regardless of what industry you're in, you have more data than you've ever had before. Yeah. The average manufacturing organization in the last 10 years has gone from having something like 68 systems to now having more than 130 mm. data producing systems in their organization. All of them are creating rich footprints yeah. of data that's really valuable, but they all speak different languages. Mm. They're all structured differently. They all come in different formats. So our goal is to say, okay, we're going to create you one, one source of truth for all that data. We're going to get all these sources speaking the same language, subscribing to the same laws of physics. And then when we can create analytics capabilities, predictive capabilities that can stretch beyond just one source at a time. It can look across these sources and help really streamline your operations and give you better insight into what's going on, more causal relationships into that data, as opposed to looking at one source at a time and trying to put the puzzle together on your own. Fascinating. And I'm really interested about the data that you're collecting. So what for like just a typical, let's just say a car manufacturing company, whoever they are in America that you're helping to work with, where, what are the key data points that you're collecting from an example, like a car manufacturing plant? Yeah. It, and it really depends on use case, right? Because the right answer is not let's just load all of this data in. All 130 systems, just get it in. And we see a lot of organizations take that approach initially, and it's really disruptive. It's hard to boil the ocean, mm. right? <laughs> so typically when you have any number of systems, anywhere between five to 10% of those systems are really the, like the core heartbeat of your organization. So when you think of manufacturing, it's your ERP system your SAPs, What's your, your NetSuite, ERP system? your Enforce, enterprise resource planning. Okay. So those are big systems that do everything from supply chain to personnel to HR, everything in between. And every manufacturing organization has one. Right. Right. You have your CRM, your yeah. customer relationship system, right? You have, and then your core operations technologies will be data that's being collected for the assemblies themselves, yeah. Yeah. connected devices, sensors, cameras, whatever that might be. So getting those all ingested, particularly the ERP, because that is historically what they've leaned on the most to learn how to, or to figure out how to steer the business. We typically start there. It's a beast, but you start there because it has the most and the richest data that's typically of the highest quality in the business. And then we supplement it with those other systems, depending on use case. Mm -hmm. So it could be marketing data, sales data. It could be shop floor data. It could be supply chain data. But depending on those use cases is how you prioritize what needs to get included next in that data infrastructure. And how easy, what's been the progression of digitalization of these manufacturing industrial companies? Because I'd imagine, I don't know, 20 years ago, they probably weren't that digitally aware that where your, your service can provide value. How has that evolved over maybe the last 10, 20 years? It's come a long way, 
The thing to think about though, is that all of these different systems are still separate from each other. So if you buy a new machine assembly today, it definitely has digital capabilities. It is, it's controlled electronically. It's spitting out data feeds every second, 10th of a second, whatever. But that data is going to reside somewhere completely different than the next machine, mm. than your ERP, than your CRM. Mm. So the data is being produced. That's why data is growing just tremendously. The average data footprint of these organizations, the, the issue lies with how do I collect all of this data into a unified place that actually brings me business advantage? Because mm. if that data is being collected over here, yeah. unless I want to just look at that data, yeah. it's a very little value to me. Mm. The value comes when you can meld everything together, yeah. get it operating under one common picture of the business, and then build your analytics or automation capabilities on top of it. So talk me through an example of a company, you don't have to name the company, but like a company that you've worked with that maybe was struggling with this and then you came in and then built them a dashboard, built them a way of tracking that and, and maybe the predictive side might be really important, but just talk me through an example that you've got. Sure. So we work with a company, they're a Finnish company. They have their American headquarters in Minnesota. They came to us and said, Hey y'all, our scrap is too high. Scrap for a reminder for your folks is comes off the assembly line, gets inspected. It's not, not up to par, either gets sent back to be worked on again, or it's relegated to a scrap heap. So they came to us and said, our scrap rate is 23%. So out of every hundred widgets we produce, 23 of them are at, at least getting rework done, which mm -hmm. is taking the spot of another widget that is coming along the assembly line or we're tossing it over our shoulder into the scrap heap. Yeah. It's costing us $40 million a year mm. in potential revenue. And so we started with that foundational stuff, collecting, collecting data that we thought was relevant. And we were able to pinpoint, okay, it's happening on this assembly line, on this machine. Typically, that's a decent place to stop. We know who the culprit is. So keep an eye on the culprit, right? But we were able to go two steps further with that to actually help them. The first was we were able to analyze that data deeper and figure out that it wasn't a subassembly. It was one particular piece of the subassembly called an extruder head. All an extruder head does is extrude raw material yeah. that gets used in the subassembly. When it was getting too hot, everything that it touched turned to scrap. So we found out that we weren't running in a position where it was like, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. It was, it's all good until it's all bad. And then the machine cools off and then it's good again. Right. So we were able to identify this one piece. We figured out, okay, when this extruder head gets over 140 degrees Fahrenheit, everything it touches turns to scrap. Right. Okay. That's typically a good place to stop. Yeah. Keep an eye on it. Yeah. Slow Let's it cool down, down every once in a while. Yeah. We went one step further and built them a system with that data to say, okay, not only should you keep an eye on that, but when it reaches 130 degrees Fahrenheit, you should notify the floor lead that this is happening. If it reaches 138 degrees Fahrenheit, we're actually going to automatically trigger a 25% reduction in assembly line speed. Yeah. Monitor it. Hopefully it comes down. If it creeps up to 139, shut it off. Right. So now you're in a position where you're not producing scrap at all. Yeah. And we were able to take them in about nine months from that 23% scrap rate down to 12. Great. Amazing. And that for them over a five year period is about $90 million wow. in gross profit. And so that's one really cool example where we went really deep with a customer. Mm. Uh, and not every customer needs to go that deep. Sometimes mm. it's just, I want to know how my business is operating. Yeah. But that's one of my favorite yeah, stories awesome. to share just because it was one little thing yeah. that other without data would have been impossible to diagnose. Mm. What 
how concerned are you with privacy hacking when it comes to cloud computing? I think I'm less concerned that the way the cloud is structured, every cloud provider has what they call a shared responsibility principle. So they're responsible for keeping their data centers secure, keeping your data, what the term is sharded across multiple data centers, right. multiple yeah. pieces. So nobody can just walk into a data center, pull out a blade, <laughs> stick it in their backpack. That happened a few years ago at an Azure Data I've, seen it, on, I've you, seen it on movies and, and television yeah, you programs. Walk in, they just walk blade. in, plug it into a yeah. computer, they've downloaded everything. <laughs> exactly. And you think you're walking out with some major multinationals data. It's just encrypted nonsense. Yeah. Um, it's The beauty of the cloud is also its greatest risk is that it's never been easier for, any, for anyone to build IT systems. Mm. The, the caveat to that or the downside of that is it's never been easier for anybody to build systems and you need to be very mindful about network rules and control policies and things like that, which is not where a lot of cloud engineers or entrepreneurs want to spend their time. I don't want to be thinking about network access control lists yeah, and yeah. subnets and things like that, but if done properly... It, the cloud is arguably more secure than a data center because on-premise data centers, there are shortcuts that are taken all the time because people think, okay, we own the four walls around mm -hmm. it. And then you're at risk of physical interaction, somebody breaking into your data center, so on and so forth. So if done correctly, the cloud is very secure. The sort of onus on all of us will be how do we continue to level up our organizations internally to ensure that things are being built as securely right. as possible. And what about environmental issues? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that is a, that's a whole separate podcast. I worry about as particularly with the AI movement, what's going on. I saw a slide last week that said data centers in the United States to date consume about 3% of the total grid, total energy grid. In the next five years, they'll consume 8%. Oh. So we don't have the grid mm. to support the ambitions of a lot of these gigantic organizations. Now it's to the point where Microsoft is just entered into a deal to, to turn back on a huge nuclear plant on the East coast, okay. that the plant that was responsible for our greatest nuclear mishap in U S history. So hopefully I think it was in the eighties. I can't remember off the top of my head. It wasn't Chernobyl, okay, but, but that, it was like, a, it was a scare yeah. that we had. And then Amazon just announced an investment in a group that is building like small modular reactors. And so it, it feels like we have no choice in the U.S. but to go toward nuclear investment, which is, is fine if done correctly. What I worry about, honestly, is how are we going to rush into this mm. to accommodate mm. the demand for AI data centers and cut corners and put things at risk? Mm. I think if done correctly... Great. Maybe it is worth it. I'm definitely not an expert in energy production, but I just worry about there's so much demand and so much force behind this that I worry that we'll cut corners and have to pay that price later. Yeah. Yeah, it is worrying because, as you say, it's constantly growing. Data is becoming more important. Larger data sets are being taken being consumed and and the world needs to change with that and, and the power grid probably isn't up to speed yet, but we need to, to to make sure that we're on top of that. And that's not just an entrepreneurial thing, that's a government thing. And I don't talk about politics in on my show deliberately. Politics and religion, we don't really touch that much. Right. But it is going to be a political decision that's going to have to be to enable these companies to be able to get these the power to be able to do all these data centers and stuff. So right. it, it's a truck problem. And for your viewers, the plant is called Three Mile Island. Okay, thank you. 
uh, for those of you who want to look it up. It's been shut down off of the East Coast for a long time, and it's getting turned back on. I'm sure everything will be great, but that that came as a bit of a an eyebrow raiser for, yeah. I think, a lot of folks here who are like, oh, I thought we were done with that yeah. because <laughs> it didn't go so well last time. Yeah. But certainly, I'm, I'm sure they'll make sure it's of high operating integrity. Well, let's, hope That's so. the hope. let's hope so. <laughs> How have you evolved as a leader over the years? Whew. Where to begin? I, mm, ooh, this is, this is juicy. I've had to really, I'll put it this way. The military taught me that delegation is extremely important. Yep. The way the Department of Defense moves as fast as it does is because they excel at delegating responsibilities as far down the totem pole as possible. And that I think allows us to move faster than a lot of nations, militaries that are much smaller Mm. is because all the decisions are made at the top and people have to figure out how to operate within those directives. The military is very good. The U S military at saying it's okay. If you're middle tier enlisted guy like me, Mm. we're going to give you a ton of responsibility. And it's on you to execute and direct and and everything like that. And so when I left the military, I felt very ready for that sort of journey. But I found that with both of my organizations, and again, this might go back to the starting versus scaling conversation. When we were in the starting mode of the business, trying to get from zero to call it 5 million in revenue, Mm. I found myself having to be a part of nearly every conversation in the business. Not micromanagey, but like everything had to run through me. I felt like I was tying a lot of people's shoes, hiring these really brilliant men and women on our team who are more than capable and just feeling like they had to get the all clear for me a lot. Yeah. And I think I have gotten a a lot better at that, right? There's a ton of trust. We hire amazing people who are are happy operating outside of their immediate function Mm. to make sure things run really smoothly. But I think that is one of, has been one of my biggest faults. The other one that I'm still not great at, to be honest with you, is waiting too long to exit people from the business. Oh, hiring I, and firing is the hardest thing in business. Hundred percent. Right. I'm, I am, I'm quick. People always say slow to hire, quick to fire. Is the yeah. is the advice I get? It's still not I easy. am the exact opposite. <laughs> it's two conversations. Mark, we're good now. Obviously, I delegate that away, so our success rate is way higher than mm-hmm. when Colin was in charge of that. But when I identify folks as they call them either terrorists or puppy dogs is like what we learn in the business. I'm really slow to move. And I don't know if it's because I feel maybe a bit of loyalty, mm-hmm. right? Which this person's been on a ride with responsibility me. as well. Yeah. Brilliant. It's this person's been with me for three years, yeah. three and a half years. And maybe we're now at a point where they're not the person They're It's not yeah. the right person in the right seat on the bus. And I find myself, instead of just going, okay, like we need to move away from this person, I go, man, what if I could just build them another seat? What if I just just give them a bucket to sit on and go along for the ride? So that's still an area where I'm weak. And I lean a lot on folks on my team who I trust deeply to say, hey, man, I think your rose-colored glasses are on a little bit here. And maybe it's time to, to make a move. Or I consult my wife, who is a lot, she's very more, she's a lot more East Coast right, yeah. direct than me. <laughs> and it's easy for her to go, yeah, rip the Band-Aid off. What are you doing here? <laughs> I have people around me who help with that. But I'd say that those are the two areas that I've worked the hardest on myself mm. to, to continue to level up yeah. as a leader. What would you say your risk appetite is? My risk appetite is high for whatever reason. Midwest, Minnesota, small town boy, typically that's not, 
you're not going to have the biggest head for risk on you. But in terms of jumping in two feet, when I started my first business, I didn't know what I was doing. I knew enough about the cloud to be able to talk about it. But that risk of, okay, now from across the ocean, working in the military, mm. I'm going to get on conference calls at eight o'clock at night with a boardroom of 50 year old people at a construction company who have never heard about the cloud, who don't care about the cloud and sell them the cloud was something that I had to embrace a lot. And I got chased out of a lot of boardrooms with pitchforks and torches back in the day. How do you because I was the sales side of it? Like how like you probably got other people doing it, but you as the CEO, there is an element of people are connected with you. How do you find that sales process talking to potential clients, potential customers about your business? That's my favorite part of the business, to be honest with you. And it's because I've always felt a, a devout passion for sharing as much of what I know mm. with people as mm. possible, even if they never sign to be a customer. Mm. I think that the trick of the trick, the goal of any salesperson should be to level up the understanding of your stakeholder as much as possible. Mm -hmm. It's a Gary Vaynerchuk yeah. sort of approach. If you're familiar with him, jab, right hook, yeah, teach them everything and have them realize they need you, that they'd be a lot better off working with you. And so that's really where we've gotten as an organization where I'll sit down with executives and actually we'll deliver an entire blueprint to them. Mm -hmm early on in the sales process at no cost. Mm. So we'll take the time to say, here's where you're at. Here's where you should go. Here's what the roadmap looks like. Here's where these different capabilities are unlocked. Here's what we think the return on investment will be for you. Yeah. Here you go. Yeah. You can hire somebody else to enact this. You can build an internal team. And most of the time they go, oh, now I know you and I like you. And because of this, I trust you. Yeah. And those are the, the core elements of, of, being successful yeah. in sales, right? Yeah. I guess we buy from people we don't like from, but for large, complex B2B sales transactions, yeah. you have to feel like that person is on your side of the table. Absolutely. That's my favorite part of, of running a business Amazing. for sure. Amazing. Look, we're coming to the end of the interview. I asked the same six questions to all of my guests. They're quick fire questions. They don't need a quick fire answer. First question is, what's the best decision that you've made? Best decision I've made in my personal life was to marry my wife and the business side was to get back into cloud data analytics after I sold the first company because I really didn't think I was going to. Oh, interesting. What's the best piece of advice you've been given? We're going to move really slow so we can move really fast. So not rushing into decisions, not giving into customer demands in a pre-sales process just to get the deal across the line, taking the time to develop that rapport, to slow down, even though customers are always saying, we need this yesterday, we need it right now, you need to move faster. Really taking the time to be deliberate with everything you do as part of your business relationship with them actually ends up speeding delivery and the growth of that relationship along so much more. I heard this quote, or I, I saw this thing on with Jeff Bezos and he said, currently what I do is I make maybe in a week, five quality decisions a week, maybe three. I it was like a very small number of, and he said, it's all about making quality decisions rather than yeah. quick decisions. And that is yep. echoed the number, like making sure you're making quality decisions for your business to make sure it's continued growth is so like we, we, it, we've got a podcast guesting agency and so many times people have said, look, I'll, we'll give you this, you deliver that and we'll probably buy later. And we're now at the stage of our business, we're turning it down because... Yeah. They choose three shows. They give you a nice amount of money for three shows over what you're charging. I think we've had this recently. And and you just know, I just know now they're going to take those shows and then not renew for a larger package. Because mm -hmm. even if you can deliver an amazing service and it all works smoothly and you have, they have a great experience, 
they're only in their head committed to three shows. So I think it's right. really important as, and this is the sort of tip and what I've taken from what you said is like making long-term decisions for your business and don't just always take a shortcut to the dollar, whatever that dollar number is, that dollar number, you need to make long-term decisions because there's all the infrastructure stuff of setting a client up, whether you're dealing with a small client or a huge client, you always have an element of that investment to get the, the, wow. the, the company set up or the client set up. So yeah, I think that is a great quote and I'm, I'm, I'm glad I remember Jeff Bezos basically echoing. I don't know if you heard that from Jeff Bezos or Jeff Bezos heard that from you, Colin. I'm I'm sure he did not hear it from me. <laughs> he's not on, <laughs> on QuickDial on your phone? <laughs> I not yet. <laughs> You'll get there, don't worry. All right, next question. Who's the person that's helped you most in your career? My father. I know I've mentioned him more on this podcast than I ever have before, but he's the hardest worker I know. Put it he was the first college educated kid in his family, grew up in a small farm town, joined the military, served honorably for a long time with the army worked at the corporate gig for a long time and learned a lot there and then went off on his own because he wanted that independence and just growing up. And he did that in my very formative teen years, mm -hmm. just watching him make that transition, seeing the freedom he had to accompany me on my traveling baseball schedule, literally every day and work with customers and build that reputation around the town we grew up in as being arguably the highest quality business of his variety that was available really instilled a lot in me. He's just a remarkable person, but I do have to give a, a shout out to Chuck Stansberry, okay. one of my former military sergeants. I was a bit of a troublemaker in the military, not anything crazy, but I like to push the limits in basically everything I did. And Chuck Stansberry was very firm as a mentor, he had very precise standards that he required of me, but because of his guidance, after his mentorship, I received Airman of the Year three years in a row with the, the group that I served. So I, I really was able to take all that energy and chaos I had in my mind and apply it to my mission as a leader in the Air Force. And he's a huge reason why I think I'm here today, Yeah, but certainly a, a reason why I was able to do what I did in the military. Amazing. So he's a huge impact on my life. Amazing. Tell me about a regret that you have. Not listening to my gut earlier on in North Lab's existence around where I think we needed to go. I had folks on my team who I had my vision for where I wanted things to be, what I thought would work for us. Mm. And that was met with a lot of blocking from folks who I ultimately exited out of the company. But there were about two years where we grew very flat in the early days of North Labs uh, because we didn't allow ourselves to make these moves and uh, ultimately take strides toward my vision. And so my regret is, it's all hindsight, of course, yeah, hindsight's twenty cool. twenty. Yeah, but my sure. regret is not being more, again, it goes back to how slow I am to move people out. If, if that happened today, you'd be out tomorrow. Mm. But especially back then, it, it dragged on for, a very, like, it was negligence on my part. It, it drew out for a very long time. And I regret not being firmer in my convictions and, and taking those actions but that's all with experience. Like now, totally. now you've been through that experience, you wouldn't ha let that happen again. When what you, right. like, what's the saying? Like you don't know what you don't know. And so <laughs> totally. You... <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I don't know a lot. <laughs> Next question. Thank you for that answer. What are you most proud of? I'm proud of the life I've built with my family. I have an excellent relationship with, my family, my wife's family, got a beautiful wife, beautiful nine year, nine month old oh. son. And I'm just, I'm in a, I'm in a happy place from that standpoint. Brilliant. That's road the focal point of my life. A long road, nine months old. 
Get We're the, just getting started. Yeah, you got to get through the toddler years. My, mine are eight exactly. and ten now, and I feel we are past. Oh, there's other challenges. <laughs> don't get me wrong. Oh yeah. There's a hundred percent different challenges, but that oh, old sle- sleep deprivation, baby proof in the house when they become toddlers. You, you're going to go all through that. Oh yeah, for sure. But it's wonderful. What is your why? So my why is to be the first provider of generational wealth for my family tree. Both of my parents worked extremely hard their entire career. My wife's parents worked extremely hard their entire career, but we don't come from a lot. And so everything was, I'm going to go work really hard. I'm going to go get it. We have to go with less sometimes because things were tight. And my overwhelming why is being able to put plant my flag in the ground as the recipient of all that knowledge and love and empowerment yeah. growing up yeah. and be able to provide for a lot more than just my immediate family from a generational standpoint. Amazing. What a great reason. What does legacy mean to you? Legacy, a continuation. I think when I think about what I want my legacy to be, it's being able to raise a kid who grows up with the same nurturing environment that I had, but always feels the desire, the passion to push the envelope, to grow his own business, to be successful in his own way, master his hobbies and crafts, et cetera. So if I can see that from, from my kid or anyone in my family, I think that's a, a cool way to, to put a cap on the little legacy that I can provide. Amazing. And where can people find you if they want to find more about you or your business? Sure. I'm only on LinkedIn. I don't have any other social media, no. but just backslash in slash Colin with two L's. We already discussed this. Yep. Colin with two L's, Graves, G-R-A-V-E-S. On LinkedIn, shoot me a follow, shoot me a, a connection. Would love to chat. Our website is northlabs.io where you can find more about what we do. And if you happen to be in that sort of position where you're looking to design data capabilities, again, we do that blueprinting effort for free. So you can either go to North Labs' website or you can go to buildmydatablueprint.com. Amazing. And that is just a little shortcut to the particular page on the website that can get you hooked up. Brilliant. Thank you so much for your time today, Colin. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you, learning more about data analytics. It's something that I think we need to develop and think about and, and hopefully Some people have been inspired and educated on this show. So thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Truly a pleasure, Mark. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to Business Growth Talks. This podcast is released every Monday, so don't miss an episode by subscribing to all podcast platforms, including Apple and Spotify. Have a great day.